Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see you on another chilly night in Scottsdale, and I would like to welcome back one of my favorite people, John LaScore. <laughs> we, we practiced pronouncing it in the back room. We did. We did a. She almost got it right. <laughs> it was the last art that did me in. Right. Um, we did a little podcast, and for those of you who haven't tried podcasts, we actually have on the on the web on our. The home page of our website, there's a thing called podcast, and when you click on it, there's a whole bunch of them, and Patrick is going to put up Nick Petrie, because I did that the other night, sitting around the fire pit drinking wine at Virtue, so there's nice. ambient noise, <laughs> clearly ambient noise. John and I are getting there after a while, uh, but John and I just had a pretty good time chatting about this and that in the back, and that's when I practiced. And I would like to thank this very nice lady over here who reminded me that baccarat was another French word that I had totally forgotten. Baccarat? <laughs> it's a game you mean? too, right? Do you know how to play baccarat? I just read a story about baccarat. Baccarat. Is it baccarat? It's game? baccarat, actually. Baccarat, but baccarat would yeah, be the British baccarat. pronunciation. It's supposedly you're supposed to get nine. Nine your, what? Your cards are supposed to add up to the letter number nine. Okay. And for some reason, that, that's, you bet on that. It was very elegant, I think. Regency. They played it at the casino in Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a very. Does anybody even know how to play any of these games anymore except poker? I don't. No. I can't even remember the last time anybody. I mean, even you know what? I just read. Out. I just read Christopher Reich's new book, and he's the one who talks about it. His Simon Risk. He goes into back around how you cheat at it. Huh? Well, I have it home on my shelf, so before I wear my necklace again, I'm going to go home and read Christopher Reich. Right. Um, actually, you know, Simon is a really great name. Or a character that, um, such as Christopher Wright, would write. Yeah, <laughs> you said that perfectly. I did, didn't yeah. I? That's good. I didn't right. stumble over it, right? So, <laughs> shall we talk about an instigating incident, which is the other <laughs> phrase I've been practicing? That's good. Right. So, what we were talking about. This is the 18th. 18th. This is Hardy. Can you believe that? Wow. wow. Hard to believe. And the first two, he was running a bar. <laughs> yeah, who was a bartender at the Little Shamrock. Right. Yeah. He decided then, then he was he was much like his off his author at that time because I was working at the Little Shamrock. <laughs> it's true. It's a real place in San Francisco. Where is it? it? Still is there. It's at Ninth and Lincoln, right where oh, I put okay. it in the books. <laughs> <laughs> so when, I, when I did my drinking in San Francisco as an undergraduate, they have a little altar for me in there. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I was famous. <laughs> I was famous at the Buena Vista Cafe. Oh, that's a good place as too. the only. As the only patron, because this is where Irish coffee comes from, they, they invented it, the Buena Vista Cafe, which is at the cable car turnaround just above Fisherman's Wharf, okay? So I was the only person, they said, who ever went back for seconds on whipped cream. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You want to hear a little poignant story? Sure. My in-laws, my wife's parents, used to go to the Buena Vista all the time, and they would drag my wife along and leave her outside looking through the window in the cold. <laughs> this is a pathetic story, but it's true. It's like the little it's match like girl. When, I, when, when <laughs> we started going out together, you know, I said, we were occasionally would go to a bar or two in San Francisco. No. And uh, she, I said, one night, let's go to the Buena Vista. She goes, no way. <laughs> we're not going to Buena Vista. I go, why not? She tells me the story. I go, that's like the most horrible parental <laughs> neglect story I've ever heard. She's standing there with her sister holding her <laughs> outside the window looking in like this. It's amazing. At least it wasn't snowing. <laughs> well, the reason I went back for the second time with cream is I really don't like the taste of whiskey, so the only way I could drink it. You know how all young drinkers drink stuff like Coke and rum, you know, or a daiquiri or something, because you don't it's really sweet. You don't really take to the yeah. to the bite of scotch when you're 17, 17. or something. Yeah. Right. 21, Barbara. 21. I never would drink before I was 21. Right. Yeah. I will tell you. The most staff digressing on this topic, in Chicago, when I was young, yeah. they had a double standard. Girls were allowed to drink at age 18, but boys had to be 21. Is that the law? Was that the law? It was the law. Wow. So when we would go to the Blue Note to hear Duke Ellington, I'm really dating myself here, or to the London House to hear Errol Garner, uh, yeah. or to hear Jerry Mulligan or whatever it is, they had to have a Coke section for the guys. So the girls could drink, <laughs> but the guys were stuck with the girls. It was hilarious. So this is a night of sad stories. <laughs> Drinking 
stories. <laughs> even better. So back to Dismas Hardy. So two years in the bar, and then you decided maybe if you were going to carry a series instead of working at a bar, maybe he'd go to law school? Yeah. He, uh, it, luckily, he turns, it turns out that he'd already been to law school. Ah. And he had been a cop, and I had all this other background that I had never used in the first two books. So he was, uh, you know, sitting there at the little shamrock one day, and, and all of a sudden a mystery happened to him, and then another one. And then I said, no, 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 we can't do this. It's got to be a bigger, bigger palette. Got to do the whole legal thriller thing instead of like the mystery book thing. So over the years, in the 16 that he's been out of the bar, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you've developed a, a really interesting ensemble cast. We've had Wyatt, you know, the private investigator, other stuff. But Phyllis, Phyllis has always been like wallpaper, right? Yeah. She has been almost like a, you know, a living joke. Where Hardy, every time she buzzes him, he goes, yo! <laughs> and it drives her crazy, and they do it, you know, five times a day, and it's just not the way a lawyer ought to act. And, it's, you know, she is such a gatekeeper, it drives her insane. And, you know, she's been nothing but fun for me. Right. You know, I mean, you know, take a paragraph or two and, you know, give Phyllis a little bit of grief, and it's a lot of fun. She's kind of like one of those running jokes in a, yeah. in a comedy. Right. And she's also a perfect legal secretary. She's perfect. Right. So all of a sudden, she's gone AWOL. Nobody can find her. Phyllis? Phyllis. I love when you email me and say, we'll see you tomorrow, and then you said, Phyllis, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> that could have been the name of the book, Phyllis, who knew? Because, uh, Better title, I actually. I didn't know. <laughs> but, you know, I was telling you the How story. is that, right? Yeah. Speaking. I was telling you the story on our podcast, but the, the whole Phyllis McGowan thing um, began... You want to hear this is a little author psyche moment. When I was two or three years old, my sister, who's 11 months older than me, Patricia, would come up to me and go, Phyllis McGowan? And I would start crying. And it was like torture. She would follow me around going, Phyllis McGowan? And I don't know who Phyllis McGowan is to this day. <laughs> but it was a name that I've, has been in my, my brain for you know 65 years. And I'm sitting here going, you know what? When Phyllis showed up in the book, on this book, on this day, this particular day, suddenly she was Phyllis McGowan. And she just, she walked onto the page as a different person than she'd been before. Oh, actually, she, she walked off the page off the out of the office. That's <laughs> what, what happened. What happened, but there we are. So the next one thing, and this is not a spoiler because it happens right up in the front. So here's Hardy, who's got a relatively elastic interpretation of the rule of law um, and he decides because nobody can reach Phyllis she's not answering her phone, she's out of the yard, whatever what if she's had like a medical incident or something I mean, it actually it's a serious question sure. not even a funny one um, and there she is in her apartment because um, she lives alone and what's he going to do so, so he enlists the other somewhat elastic interpreter of the law, Abe, right? So the lawyer and the cop go to Phyllis's apartment and they break in. Well, we learned that Hardy has learned how to pick locks from his friend Wyatt Hunt. And you know, it's really not one of the tricks in a lawyer's handbag usually that you know, we're going to pick locks in houses of our clients and our you know employees. But that's what they went ahead and did. And you know, it had tremendous, I think, really fun, tremendous serious repercussions all through the book in terms of how Hardy dealt with the fact that he kind of, well, he broke the law is what he did. And, you know, it, it was, it's been interesting, it's all, all the way through the book, it, it keeps recurring as a moral motif, if you will. And uh, I think it's a really pretty cool thing that they wound up doing and surprised even their author as they did it. <laughs> you, you, you've mentioned surprise several times. Is this a book that sort of came up? I mean, they this, all are. <laughs> really? Yeah, you don't know what you're going to do when you start these things. You have no idea. I have no idea. I'm, I'm 15 pages into a new book, and I have no clue what it's about. She's <laughs> Phyllis is missing. Phyllis is back. <laughs> she's back home. We don't even know, though. I haven't talked about Phyllis. She's going to no. go back to her earlier role. Something. Right. So anyway, that's yeah. the instigating incident. Is Phyllis is not the in the instigating office. Instigating incident. I love that. And we're going to break in, and then it's all going to kind of go from there. By now, Hardy's got um, multiple people he can call on. I mean, for example, Wyatt, the one we've mentioned, sure. who's had a book or two of his own, which I really like. Yeah. You going to give him another book? Didn't I just say, I don't know what I'm writing on the book? <laughs> and, and if 
you don't think I don't know what, what I'm writing on the book I'm currently writing on, the one after that is even more obscure. <laughs> well, it could be Wyatt. Here's the thing. I've decided that your subconscious is in control, so if I keep chanting, I will implant it in your mind, and then you will sit down. Well, here's the deal. Why we know now is a father. He, he's, I think in this book, he's a father. And I'm a new grandfather. So I'm going to have a little baby probably crawling around in my real life. And I'm not sure dramatically that it's going to be the most important thing I ever do, is put Wyatt's baby in there. Oh, I don't know. As, as I said. You have to be sure there's an adequate caregiver, though, <laughs> if you have a baby. Hi, I'm going to go out now with my son. <laughs> exactly. Hope you're okay when I get back. Mm. You know. Yes, we, you do have to keep track of the baby if you introduce the baby into the story. That's why, that's why I'm hesitant, to say the least. Mm. Yes. My, yeah. my daughter might be really mad at me if I put her, her baby It can be there. a complicating incident. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're liking it. Or the incident of the dog in the nighttime. <laughs> Well, no. Yeah, but yeah. Right. Okay. That's, okay. That was a crib from Sherlock it Holmes, was. but it certainly did grow. Hey, did you any of you see the play? It is really bizarre. I just play. thought it's called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, oh. and it was on Broadway and nominated for a Tony. We went to see it. I said, I said to Rob and Dennis Stafford, I was going to say, you're going to love it. It's really Sherlock Holmes, and, you know, and. Um, it's, it's actually a really moving book about a, a yeah. boy with autism, you oh. know, who... Um, so it's not really the Sherlock Holmes... Well, it, it, he sort of functions like that. I mean, it's great. When you, when you see it on Broadway, it's all in kind of... Inter or wherever it is, sort of interesting fluorescent lights and bears almost no resemblance to the book. So, I mean, they said to me, you said we'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? Yes, and it, you know, two hundred and some a ticket. It was, it was not my. It was not you my got a deal. Small two hundred and something per ticket. Whatever. Yeah. I know. We never did go see Aladdin. I wasn't up. It was three ninety five a shot if you wanted to see Aladdin in New York. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how Broadway. We're, we're going to see Hamilton next month in, in, in New York. San Francisco. Oh, okay. but it's in the eights. Mm -hmm. Oh. Down from, 2200. down from 2200. Down from 22. Way passed on it. Way yeah. we're in New York. I got roped into it, so I'm, I'm going. But I'm, I'm a little bit kicking and screaming again. Be sure you listen to it ahead of time. I've because, got it on my desk. I yeah, have because a CD on my it's, desk. this is rap. If you don't, if you haven't familiarized yourself with the lyrics, you will miss the entire thing. Right. Sounds very well. We've digressed once yes, again. We have. Right. <laughs> so, um, what more? What, what more can we say about the rule of law? We know that Abe. Well, is, we can say that this book was uh, started about two weeks after the 2016 elections. <clears throat> and I had just finished um, Poison, last year's book. Right. And I was casting about for something to write about. And thematically, I was kind of taken over by the idea of this, uh, the, the changes in our governance. That's very delicate. But, <laughs> right. I'm yeah. trying to think. I mean, it's not. It's not what you think. I mean, I think this is a good standalone book, but it's all about, you know, the, the, the serious issues that we're living with nowadays, especially with the immigrant problem, mm -hmm. and because that's what this book is. And San of, Francisco is a sanctuary city, city, right? Yes, it is. Right. Whatever Which, that means anymore. The um, ever fluid landscape that we inhabit. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, which we have touched upon, you're right on the edge of Silicon Valley. I was on the edge of it chronologically because David Packard was in my graduating class at Stanford and hosted our- David, uh, as in you would? Yes. Packard? Yeah. Uh, hosted our graduation party in this enormous mansion. And when we got there, we all sort of went, who the hell is David Packard? You know, it was like, it was, it was not, not a parent. Well, you know, it's interesting. That my, my daughter lives there, the one with the new baby. Yeah. She lives in San Jose, and she lives in within the one square mile area that Google announced that they were going to redevelop everything in that square mile. Right. And so it's been very good for their, their well, their property values, their property values have, have like gone crazy, which you know they didn't need to go crazy to begin with because San Jose is crazy to start with. But, right. but so, it's been crazy. 
Well, clearly, I, I'm not a seer or a person who has any ability to read the future based on the fact that I was there and didn't pay any attention. Right. <laughs> but um, you're on kind of the geographical edge of it. What sort of changes do you see going on? I mean, it's got Just to be... Just the, the crowding in, in the... In the no, no, but I'm, at, I'm at in people's reactions towards big tech and, and um, whatever. Well, You've got material for a lot of books. Well, yeah, to be right at your to hang out there, right. I mean, in, in the last book, I had Hardy Stun working for Facebook. Right. And he still is, I believe, working for Facebook. Although You're not sure? I'm not sure. <laughs> he might be in this new book I'm writing. For all I know, he might be. A, that might be who the book is about. You know. <laughs> Wyatt. 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 <laughs> I know he's coming. Yeah, but seriously, you've got you've got so much material um, just unfolding all around you, San, San Francisco, Sacramento, and so forth. You're never going to run out of ideas. No, I know it's pretty crazy. It's it's really a very vibrant time, and it's also a little scary. But the good news is that you have this very flexible cast. Yeah, know, I think there's going to be with. more people coming in. I'm, I'm Sure. People yeah. we haven't met yet? I would think so. Wow, that's encouraging, <laughs> isn't know. it? Now, since you are six... Marty's getting a little old. He's almost as old as me. No. Yeah. So, you know, he can't be really like a sexy leading man for too much longer. <laughs> well, he could be a leading man, but probably not be some of the really... Um, you guys know what I'm physical talking about. Physical stuff. <laughs> no, we're not going no. We're not going Easy there. now. <laughs> oh, big tigers. Um, <laughs> how old's Wyatt? I mean... Wyatt's a kid. Yeah, that's what I thought. He's like uh, 40-ish. So you could have like a, a new partner. Well, that's why he's. That's why I brought him in, literally, like right. five or six years ago. Sure. I said, some of these guys are getting a little long in the tooth. I'm going to bring in this young guy. And what about like a junior partner at the law firm? Graham Russo. Right. Yeah, he's already there. You could bring he's gonna, him on. He's going to show up in this book. And you could possibly have a female junior partner at the law firm. Rebecca. Okay. See, we got them all covered. You got it. You got everything but the butt, you know, that's running around from office to office, and that probably is going to happen in this book, too. I thought we were going to have a baby running around in the office. <laughs> that's the next book. <laughs> this is fine. It is so hard to keep up with Sean. You know? um, also, um, he's doing a pretty good job, but you know, he's actually like a book or two ahead, so you're, you haven't given me that. Actually, this is the latest book I know, that I've written. But in... Oh, it is? You yes. haven't actually started the next a, one? I don't have a next year's book. Oh, okay. It's the book I'm writing now, but it won't be out next year. No. Sorry. <laughs> Takes a while. I think it's going to be a, next year's book is going to be like a placeholder of short stories. Short stories. Did you get derailed by being your grandparent? No, I just decided I was tired of writing for contracts. Ah. And I decided, uh, you know, I, I'd done 25 years in a row. Right. And I said, I'm going to take a year off. I've already done it, so you can't say no. Well, it's a done deal. <laughs> that year is behind me. I'm going to put pressure on Atria. But meantime, tell us, tell us about your short fiction. Well, I've published, you know, maybe 20 short stories in various anthologies and all kinds of different. No, I didn't realize it was nearly so many. Yeah, yeah. And so um, Atria wanted to buy them all from me, um, and they did three books ago. Okay. And they wound up doing nothing with. So I went to my agent this a couple of months ago, and I said, you know, since we don't have a new book coming out next year, why don't we go back to Atria and suggest that they finally do something with these short stories, which they, in fact, already own. So why not just have it come out and be a good place? Otherwise, they're a wasting asset. They are. You know. And some of these stories, if I do say so myself, are pretty good. <laughs> you to say so, right? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. So I, is, it, is it a whole mix? Yeah, it's a mix of yeah, things. Yeah. It's all individual short stories. None of these guys. All different. Well, I want to be fun. Yeah. And interesting. Yeah. Right. There's two Sherlock Holmes stories. But you were, one of you them know, is almost a novella. It's so good. One, one of them is How long has it long. been since you wrote those two Sherlock Holmes novels? You want to know when I wrote them or when I published them? Either one. I wrote <laughs> the first one, Son of Holmes, when I was 22. And I got it published when I was 36. For those of you doing the math, it sat in my sock drawer for 14 years unread while I was struggling to do other things to get published. And little did I know, I had this this stupid story. It's not stupid, but it's been in the world now for 50 years. And there's another one. And Rasputin's Revenge. Right. Yeah. I knew Which is even better than Son of Holmes. Okay. So you're going to go back to that universe. I, do you belong to the Baker Street Irregulars on this? I have, I have spoken to them several times, but I do not belong. Oh, 
Wow, Sherlock Holmes credits. Who knew? I think no. that's great. Oh, so, yeah. I am the one who came up with the idea that Nero Wolf was Sherlock Holmes' son. Which I think the canon, <laughs> I think the canon recognizes that as the truth. Wow. <laughs> Why not? Right. It's like okay. Phyllis. Who knew? <laughs> I'm you gonna, probably have those books here somewhere in the store. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write. Next time I write you, I'm gonna say, Rasputin, Sherlock, who knew? Right. Um, if you thought ever about writing any more of them aside from short stories? Well, I was somewhat dissuaded because there was a licensing fee of hold your breath here, fifty dollars back then in the day. <laughs> To, you, you paid it to the Holmes estate and they right. gave you permission to write like the 7% solution. But, but you do know that Leslie Klinger successfully argued in the Supreme Court. I do know that. And but now you don't have to pay Long them before that, long, long before that, 35 or 40 years before that, okay. when Son of Holmes came out, yeah. the estate, well, let's just say my publisher at the time, Donald I. Fine, decided not to pay the $50 and just put it out there. So, Ouch. So when it came out, the Holmes estate told me that they would sue me if I did another one. And so I then, because I had to, I invented business art. Other than writing another one. Really the, I that's didn't really realize that was the origin of the story. That's there. how it began. Wow. Because I couldn't write another Sherlock Holmes story. But you could now. I could now, but I'm not interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> Timing is everything, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, I did my short, my long short story in yeah. this new book that may or may not come out is called Coventry. And in it, Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes himself um, plays a role in the evacuation of um, <coughs> the evacuation of World War One. <coughs> hello. You know what it was. World War Two. You talk about Dunkirk? Dunkirk. But that's World, World War, War II. Two. Yes. Yeah. That's, what, that's, that's why I gave you this blind book. <laughs> I knew it when I wrote it. <laughs> Coventry's the name of the book, and I don't know why. I mean, the short story. I don't know why. Now I forget. Truly, it would have been wonderful if there had been an evacuation of World War One and saved yeah, lives. That would have saved the all those lives of World all War II. Yeah. Uh, right. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, so anyway, really, that's that was really it. The Holmes people said, "Don't do it again," and I said, "Well, now what am I going to do?" <laughs> well, I said, "I might as well write a, you know, modern mystery set somewhere." And since you were in a bar, it seemed obvious. I was 38 years old, like Disney Sardi. I was working at the Little Shamrock, like Disney Sardi. My house was on 34th Avenue at Clement, like Disney Sardi. Why does he bit. play the guitar? I didn't want to get the music thing wrapped up in my books. Because John is a very serious guitarist, as many of you may know. Um, in fact, you, you actually brought your guitar here one time, I and did. we had a little concert. I did. So maybe if you come with the short stories, we could perk it up with another guitar. Anything can happen, boy. Anything can happen, <laughs> especially if we have wine first. Yes. Right? Always a good idea. And more things could happen. More things could happen. <laughs> right. Well, um, you guys have questions that you would like to ask John? I feel that we've depressed as much as we probably ought to be depressing. <laughs> as much as you cannot discuss a book while you're discussing a book. Well, the thing, the thing I think about we've set this, a record here. No, but the thing about this particular book is once we've given the setup and we say anything more, we're going to absolutely ruin it for you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if this is not a book where you can go very far um, without starting to give away... Give away plot points. Yeah, yeah. so that's why we're depressing. You know, the whole thing with, you know, the poodle who comes in and, oh, no, never mind. The poodle that's chasing the baby. <laughs> the <right>? baby. <laughs> yeah, there's the baby, baby. <laughs> Back again. Okay. It's actually a very good and very interestingly plotted story. But, um, in fact, I think that all of John's stories are very well plotted. And we, we could give a little shout out here to your friend, Al. Yeah, sure. All the uh, legal stuff in my books. I write my books with nobody's help at all. I just write from beginning to end. And with no I'm idea done. what you're doing, but it right. gets there, right? I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I, when I'm done, I hand it to my guy, luckily, who was my best friend from the age of 14 in high school, named Al Giannini, who went on to become a homicide district attorney in the Bay Area. So I give him my books as soon as I get finished. He's the first reader, and he goes back and he says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Everything you do about the law is wrong. <laughs> Here's what would really happen. Here's what would really happen. And I take, you know, fully 50% of what he gives me. And I say, okay, I'll, I'll fix that a little bit. So now, I, this brings me to a really special question. Yeah. What did he have to say about the law when Hardy and Blitzky broke into the law? He said, you can't have him do that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to do it. Too bad. And 
Well, I'm, I was going to give away another plot point, no, but I'm not going that. to. But yeah, there's several things in this book that I just said, no, this is too good a story to, to worry about verisimilitude. So taking this one further, I have asked John, so when you decided to, buy, to write about Wyatt Hunt, you didn't need Al, and John said... I said, well, I did. I called up Al and I said, do you know any <laughs> private investigators? And he goes, sure. He said, want to have lunch with one of them? I said, yeah. So that was it. I came down, went down, met this guy, Mike Myers, for he's, he was the uh, PI, and we got along famously and invited me back to his office, and I hung out there for a few days and learned some of the nuts and bolts of the <coughs> world of the PI business, and then I was ready to forge ahead with deathless prose. <laughs> Just sort of suck all this stuff <laughs> up, don't you? I don't know. It's kind of goofy. That was fun. It certainly makes wonderful books, but I still think you must have, in the back of it, you must have a basically criminal mind. And you just tell me. <laughs> no, I, I do think it's true. I, I think of bad things and then have other people do them. <laughs> we had Poison Pen Press, had this wonderful author that many of you may have met named Frederick Ramsey. Fred Ramsey who's just a lovely guy. He was a, a teacher and he's an ordained minister in all, all kinds of good things. And I was invited to speak, to do a, a um, oration at, at Fred's memorial service in the church. And his wife is also now an ordained minister's widow at this point. So I got up in front of this vast group of people who are all pretty serious there. We're in the, in the church. And I started out by saying, well, if Fred had failed, I said, at his calling, he could have made a terrific career criminal. And there was this sort of, <gasps> you know, from all these people. But I meant it, I meant it sincerely a as a, it was a compliment, because Fred, like you, was an absolutely genius plotter, uh, although he didn't know where he was going, and, um, and very original. So you never knew for sure where you were going with one of Fred's books, but it was always fabulous and you know um, I just he said that he he learned so much about human nature in his well, yes. in his role that right. you know it took practically no effort for him to come up with pride guys well fraud and other sure. sorts of, you know mo most mysteries have a murder in them just because it makes the stakes high but I find some of the most interesting stuff is not the murders but the other stuff you know the frauds and the thefts and the Right. Other things that you know texture it up and make it interesting. Totally agree. So, um, back to questions. Yes. Uh, my question is about the <laughs> sister who came up with Phyllis McDonald. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever give her any credit for it? I called her when I wrote when I first when Phyllis McGowan showed up on the page. I called her up. I said, "You're not going to believe what just happened," <laughs> and she was just thrilled. She was just oh, happy as can be. Perfect. Has she Not ever true. explained the origin of Phyllis she, I Man? asked her, I said, Why, who was she? <laughs> and Pat goes, I don't know anymore. I mean, I don't remember. She said, but I just remember saying Phyllis McGowan and it just used to drive you crazy. <laughs> 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 a latent sadist. <laughs> oh, <laughs> pretty scary. Oh. So we'll never know. Is anybody going to Google Phyllis McGowan? <laughs> 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 she might Maybe have. there's a real person out there. Well, you know, I mean, she could have figured in, you know. Houston, Texas, 1940s. Was that where it was? Wow. Maybe she was like a well digger, rigger. Any, anything you think could be true. Would have been true of Phyllis McGowan. Yeah. Exactly. I am now going to go home and I'm going to wake up. I just know it's three in the morning. Go, who is Phyllis McGowan? Phyllis McGowan. Try to figure That's it out. Like, oh, you yeah, had to have the intonation. That was really dark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was a Halloween. Did you have a neighbor named McGowan? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. All right, other questions? Yes. yes. In your acknowledgments, you mentioned C.J. Fox. And yes. He's another of my favorite I love him. You're number one, but he's probably number two. He'll be here March 11th. Pardon me? Have you met him? Oh, yes. In fact, we've gone fishing together in oh, Baja, California, and okay. done a bunch of fun stuff together. Oh, yeah. He's a great guy, but he is, I just love his writing. Mm -hmm. I just love wolves. In right, fact, right. I have on my phone right now under notes. It's not so bad. <laughs> this is terrible. But, you know, as, as well as being authors, we're often fans of each other because, you know, we love this stuff. And uh, I was getting to the point that I was starting to rebuy books of CJ Chops because I didn't remember that I'd read it. 
<laughs> so I wrote them down, and I have my notes. I have books by C.J. Box that I've read, and I have <coughs> going down, so I, you know, go out. But I, I bought another one last week, and I already had it. <laughs> Even worse, I had it in paperback. <laughs> I had it in hardcover, and then I bought the paperback. You can donate it to your library. Yeah, well, I, I did. Excellent. Yeah. Did you hear me say March 11th? That's, That's when C.J. will coming. be here, March 11th. Oh. <coughs> Not here. We're going to be he at the um, Cultural Center at ASU. <laughs> the reason I acknowledged him in the book is because he was, I, I was getting stumped in here and just getting kind of down about it and feeling like this is hard and I'm not having a lot of fun. And I was reading one of his books and it was just so fluid and easy going and, I mean, serious stuff going on in the book, but the way he told it was just <laughs> made you laugh every few pages and had a good time. And I just said, this is what I got a bit, you know, I took it as a kind of a, a silent mentoring class and I just got back into this and just rocked through it. And a lot because Want of another the another Sure. So when Rob and I are grabbing around Wyoming, going to visit, among other things, CJ, he, when we arrive at the ranch, he has a shooting gallery set up up on the hill. So we hike up there and he shooting skate with his Seriously. daughter's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And CJ said to me, I bet you've never fired a gun. Mm. You should do that, he said. So he hands me a 45, and we work all that out. <laughs> Knocks me over, right? Because I'm not very big in the hall. But no, he said, that's too much gun for you. Let's try this smaller gun. Right. Uh, but I'll remind me at dinner, I'll show you on my phone. Um, Are you shooting? Well, I have, but turned out my husband, to my amazement, is a crack shot at ski. <laughs> So CJ would go pull and Rob would, you know, and it would explode. Really? And yeah, so there we are up in the hill behind CJ's house, you know, having this wonderful time. And then the most huh. interesting thing of all is we walk back and we're standing on his balcony looking in the other direction, and a black funnel descends from the sky. Really? A tornado? An absolute tornado. I have a photo of it also on my phone, which is also on Instagram because I put it there. This black funnel descends from the sky and Right, at, right away over here from where he lives are the snowy mountains, and it goes like this down towards the mountain. Now, the thing about where CJ lives is this very small town, and it has a very small airport, and when we got there, there was one private jet in the airport. That was Thursday. On Friday, when we came back from Sunday night, the airport was totally full of all these little private jets, and it turns out the reason is there's some really high-class wellness ranch, whatever it is, up in the mountain, hmm. the tornado is like going right for it. CJ's going, oh my God, <laughs> it's gonna suck them all up there. Wow. This is where Ivanka, Trump, and Jared hang out and whatever it is, so we're all going, oh good. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it was so, I mean, it was like a perfect Wyoming thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna put the photos up behind him oh, when we're doing our talk, I have to put them on uh, I have to, I love it. I will have a person. <laughs> Otherwise known as my husband. Put them on a stick and um, and I can have them show them, um, show you, you know. But there's a wonderful photo of CJ with his rifle, and his, I mean with his shotgun ski gun. And you, know, you can see the thing and there he is. Um, but anyway, so the new book is all about wolves. Yes. So now you've had a preview. And by the way, my new grandchild that's gonna be born in May Another Number baby? Two, same, Another same baby? Same daughter. Two, and okay, very two babies time. crawling around? Yeah. With a lot of us? His name is going to be Wolf. I love it. Yeah. See? I don't know why that, that has to do with it. Other, other I'll drop CJ email and say you've inspired him. <laughs> yes, there it is. Uh, that's too funny. Right. So, have you guys any other questions? I'm actually looking at Wyoming right behind you on the TV because these are photos from that very trip and we're in Yellowstone. Ooh, see, oh, there's Morning Glory Pool. Cool. See, there it is. Wow. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure if CJ will come up. <laughs> I, I don't think so, but I should never leave that on when I'm sitting up here because it's a total <laughs> distraction. Yeah. I know. There we go. Um, question? Come on, we've depressed all we can depress. <laughs> <laughs> so if your new grandson is named, going to be named Wolf, yeah. what is your current grandchild's name? Cora Violet. Oh my god. Boy, these are originals. They're not just thumbing through the ordinary book of names. Together, yeah. Cora Violet and you know, she is the cutest baby ever born. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. I like being a grandma. Of course you're a 
encourage a special all. relationship. It is. Yeah. Right. You have all the fun, none of the, the, the secondary <laughs> responsibilities. <laughs> Sorry. Also. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. Mm. Okay. All right. Anybody else have a question? We're going to be done awfully soon here. We'll tonight. sign books. Right. Well, we could do that. Do right. Well, all right. If you're going to sign off, then thank you so much for coming. Let's give John a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. audience watching us on video this evening for joining us and um, we could have used your questions and so I'll do it up this evening. Right. Well, the podcast is up. I just put it up. You did? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So see how fast that we is. We didn't digress very much in the podcast. We were kind of on point. Focused. We were focused. <laughs> focused. Right. Um, yep. Yeah. All right. So okay. I'm going to ask John